Hey, what's up? It's Karen San Diego. Welcome to part three of my three part Q&A VSG updated Q&A series. If you have not already watched part one and two of this series, pause. Go back and make sure you watch those two to catch up first before you watch this one. There'll be a lot of questions that are different in those that you may not get in this video. So I have three separate videos full of Q&A questions. So watch those first. But if you are still here, I assume that you've already watched those. So thank you so much for watching all three videos. I hope you are getting a lot of information from these and finding them useful. And with that, we're going to just jump into part three of this Q&A. All right, so the first question I have is, can you make a meal ebook from starts from the starting stage to the stage you're at now, what you ate and what you're eating? So ebook is something that has actually been crossing my mind recently. I don't know if I wanted to do it about food, because honestly, I feel like I just be eating whatever. Like I like to keep my meals balanced and nutritious, but I don't like think that much into it, if that makes sense. So I don't know if I could do an ebook on that. But I was thinking there might be something I could do an ebook around related to VSG. So if you have any ideas of a type of ebook you would want from me, let me know in the comments so I can start brainstorming that. Um, but yeah, an ebook does sound like something that I could potentially want to do in the future. Next question says, do you ever not feel satisfied from food? Like, don't feel full? Um, yeah, some, there are certain things where I don't feel full. And honestly, if I don't feel like I'm full, I'll eat a little bit more, depending on what it is. Like, if I eat a cookie and I don't feel full, I'm not going to have another cookie. Unless I want another cookie, and then in that case, I'll have another cookie. But usually with food food, I do end up feeling full. And if I don't feel full, it's because I'm not. And in that case, if I don't feel full and I still feel hungry, I'll have more food. But if I don't feel full and I also don't feel hungry, then I won't have any more food. Because you don't actually need to eat until you feel full. I'm actually one of those people who don't enjoy the feeling of feeling full, I don't wanna feel full. To me, that feels uncomfortable. I feel stuffed like a turkey. I rather just feel content. So if I don't feel full, but I don't feel hungry, I won't eat anymore. But if I don't feel full and I still feel hungry, then I'll just have some more until I don't feel hungry anymore. So um, to answer this question properly, the feeling, the sensation that I'm eating for is hunger. So if I'm hungry, regardless of what I've eaten that day, if I am hungry, I'm going to eat. But if I am not hungry and just I just I'm just not full, I'm not going to eat to get to the point of feeling full, if that makes sense, because we don't need to be full. But if I'm hungry, I'll just have more. Next question says, how did you start doing VSG content? I'm interested in sharing my journey. So um, there's two different things here. So if you are someone who has not had surgery yet, I suggest that you start by one, getting as many before pictures and videos as humanly possible. I'm talking get like transition. So show yourself and then put your hand out and then take your hand so that you can use those because um, you're going to want that for content. Um, do have videos where you're like turning around so we can see your entire body. Get shots of your entire body. Get videos of yourself moving. Get videos where you look cute even though you're bigger. Um, just get lots and lots and lots of content beforehand. That's where I'd say to start if you haven't had surgery yet. Then I would say start filming your journey from as soon as you can. So for me, I'm a um, don't talk about it till I did it type of person. So I'm not the type of person to, I vlogged the day of surgery and I didn't release it until after surgery. That was just my preference. But if I could do this again, I would have started vlogging earlier and just not posted it until after I got the surgery. So I'd recommend that as well. And the reason for that is for social media, people enjoy watching a journey. They want to see from beginning to end what happened. They want to be along for the ride. So for as much as you can take people along with, that's what you want to do. Also, making sure that you are also ready to be extremely vulnerable. In order to be successful, I think on social media, whether it's YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, you need to be vulnerable. You have to let people in in a way that may feel uncomfortable to you. Um, for me, I am someone I like to consider myself a private oversharer. <laughs> I think it's a good way to explain myself. I'm very willing to share details about my life that most people would not share while still maintaining a certain level of privacy in my life. And you have to at least be able to be that in order to be successful because people want to know what's really going on. They want to be along for the ride with you 
and feeling vulnerability is the best way to connect with somebody. Um, and if you're not prepared to do that, then I wouldn't say that you should share the journey because it's not easy to open yourself up to criticism from people you have never met before. I will say as somebody who frequently shares my weight loss journey online, I open myself up to very personal questions, which I'm usually okay with answering just by the nature of who I am as a person. But you're also opening yourself up to negative negativity, negative comments, hate comments, those type of things. I've grown a backbone to where I genuinely don't care about the negative comments. But if you don't feel like you can handle that, just understand that it comes with the territory. Like sharing your, your, your journey and becoming a content creator is not all the glitz and glam that it that it can seem like. Um, when people look at it and they see the brand deals, they see all that type of stuff, that stuff is cool. But there's a mental toll that comes with it that people aren't prepared for. So I'd say one, start with getting all the content you can beforehand, but also make sure that it's something that mentally you can actually commit to and that you think that you can handle. And when I say handle, I mean as far as open yourself, opening yourself up to the eyes and the criticism of people you have never met before. For me personally, I was I was creating content before I got surgery. I of course grew a way larger audience after surgery, but before surgery I was already doing this, so I kind of was like training myself. So I think another tip there would be if you are considering doing content once you get the surgery but you're not getting surgery yet, start making content now about something else, right? It doesn't have to be even about the surgery. Just start making content just to get yourself accustomed to putting yourself out there, to getting yourself accustomed to talking to a camera, because even this takes a while to get accustomed to, and just to start building the muscle of being a content creator. Start making reels, start making shorts, start making TikToks, start doing the things to get yourself into the habit. That way, when you actually do have the surgery, you already, that muscle has already been flexed and you can get into it easily. But um, as far as creating content for the surgery, start planning ahead of time and get those before clips. And then start filming as from the day you get surgery. Start then so you can track your entire journey. Next question says, do you take B12 injections? If yes, how often? So B12 was a vitamin that I was deficient in. I do not take B12 injections. I do, however, take B12 drops, although I am not currently B12 deficient. I still take the drops because I feel like it does help with my energy. Um, so I take the B12 drops. It never has gotten bad enough for me to need the injections, but I do know that that is something that is common for other people. And if you do need the injections, there's a lot of negative things that can happen as a result of being low in B12. So if you do need the injections, keep taking them. But over time, you can improve. Like, I was severely B12 deficient, but then by the time I went back for my blood work, because of the way that I eat and the fact that I'm consistent with my vitamins, it did level off to where now I don't even need the drops. I just choose to still take them. Um, but yeah, I never had to take the injections. Next question says, do you have any hobbies? Um, I don't know if I would say I have a hobby. I think... I, at one point, I would have called YouTube and like content creation to be my hobby, but at this point now, I consider it to be a job, um, a job that I love, but nevertheless a job, like it's not a hobby. Um, as far as hobbies, no, I don't think I have any hobbies. Maybe going to the, like fitness could be considered a hobby, or at one point I used to really like to draw, just like, like that could be a hobby, but um, no. Actually, no, during the pandemic, I had an Etsy shop where I made African baby bows. I, I made baby bows with African fabrics. I would consider that to have been a hobby when I was doing that, but that was really like a pandemic, I need purpose and I'm bored type of thing. But outside of that, no. I, I'm either working, mommying, in the gym, or creating content. All right, next question says, how long did it take you to get your surgery approved from consultation to surgery? So this um, process is going to vary person to person depending on your insurance. For me, when I had surgery, I had Cigna insurance. For Cigna, at least under the plan that I was on, there was no designated waiting period that you needed to do prior to surgery. So as fast as you can get your pre-op appointments done was as fast as you could have your surgery. So for me, that was around three months. I want to say somewhere between two, two to three months from consultation to surgery, but that could have gone faster. 
And the only thing that was holding it up is that when I got my surgery, I was teaching at the time. I was a fifth grade history teacher. And because of that, I had a pretty demanding work schedule to where I couldn't just call out whenever to go to the doctor. So I had to kind of work around my work schedule. And that made it, I had to just schedule my things a little bit later than I would have if I wasn't teaching. So that made it take long. But if I wasn't teaching at that time, I probably could have gotten all of those appointments done within a month. All right, next question says, um, can you recommend iron supplement that does not cause constipation? So I don't take an iron supplement only because I am not iron deficient. If you are iron deficient, you should take an iron supplement as well as a bariatric supplement. For me, I get my iron from my bariatric supplement. I take the Berry Life Just One multivitamin with iron. So that's where I get my iron from. And it doesn't, for me, it doesn't cause constipation. Um, so taking an iron supplement on top of that, I would not know about which one is best. So for that, I would ask your doctor what they rec recommend as far as getting a really good quality iron supplement. All right, next question says, what advice do you give to someone 30 days out from surgery? 30 days, so one month post-op, what I would say my biggest advice to this person, you're eating regular food now, my advice would be to really just work on your relationship with food and building a healthy relationship with food that does not resemble diet culture. So that doesn't mean just eat whatever you want, eat a bunch of junk food, but it means learn how to eat things in moderation, learn how to eat a balanced nutritional meal. Um, at this time, you still should be eating more protein than anything else, but learning how to just have a positive relationship with food and not looking at it as like, oh my God, if I eat, a one bite more, I'm going to gain 100 pounds because you're not. And really just focus on your relationship with food and your relationship with your body during this time so that long term you can be successful because you have built and have worked to build a really, really healthy relationship with food and your body. All right, next question says, when were you able to drink water normally again? I'm eight weeks post-op and I can't get more than 32 ounces. So to drink water normally, so I'm a chugger, like I drink my water very fast which can sometimes make me feel a little bit nauseous. Um, so I say I didn't start drinking water that way until maybe like, maybe like around three to four months. I don't know. If you watch my updates, I think I mentioned when I started like drinking my water as normal. Prior to that, the way I was able to get my water in was sips. I have my water bottle and I would keep it in my hand with me wherever I went and just sip randomly. Just keep sipping. You don't have to chug just keep sipping and that's gonna help you just get the water in. And eventually when your restriction starts to like level out, you'll be able to drink water normally. Now I can drink water just like a normal person would. Like I don't have to like sip anymore, I can drink as normal. It took a while to get there, but in the beginning I just, I just took sips. Just tiny sips, just keep sipping. I have my water bottle in my hand the way I keep my phone in my hand. Like my phone is almost always in my hand. Back then, my water bottle was almost always in my hand. So I think that's the best way to make sure you're getting your water in. All right, next question says, I'm struggling to drink my fluids. Any suggestions? I'm six weeks post-op. Okay, so at six weeks post-op, keep in mind that while water is what I suggest, like I don't even like the little flavor packets that people like. I think water is what you should be drinking. Real water, not flavored water, just water, water. But at six weeks post-op, when you're just trying to get enough fluids in to literally survive, I recommend trying to get your fluids in and however you can get it, whether you need to flavor your water. Your protein shake does count as fluid, so hopefully you're adding that to your, to your um, liquid intake. Whatever you can do, and also sip. Also, if that's what you can get in and you know that you are trying your hardest, then be easy on yourself. Don't try to force it to where you're in pain, but just keep your water bottle in your hand and sip as much as possible. Flavor it if you need to. Something I like to do at that point, I didn't really love the actual protein shake. I would do protein water. That was really helpful during that time because it tasted like juice. Um, but yeah, I like water, water. I would say just sip as often as possible and don't put too much pressure on yourself to get exactly the 64 ounces, but just try your best. I used to have, at when I was early post-op, I had the water, and it's linked in my Amazon storefront if you want to get it. But I had the water bottle with the times on it, so like I was able to look at it and be like, all right, by this time, and I think the water bottle was a 32 ounce bottle, so I knew I had to drink it twice in order to get the 64 ounces in it. In. 
So looking at the time and making sure by each time that I was drinking that. So by 12 o'clock, I needed to drink to where the 12 o'clock line was. And that was a way to help hold me accountable to getting the right amount of water in, especially in the beginning when you are still building that relationship with food and building your relationship with how you have to learn to eat from now on. All right, next question says, um, hi, Karen, love your content. I want to do VSG and wanted to know how you found your doctor. All right, so my doctor, I wasn't referred by anybody. I was actually referred to a doctor that one of my husband, someone my husband knows that had surgery. She went to a certain doctor and I tried to go to that doctor, but they didn't take my insurance. So at that point, I just got on Google and I looked up surgeons and I ended up finding the New Jersey Bariatric Center where I had my surgery. I read reviews. I looked in forms. Like I tried to figure out like which um where where would be a really good place to go and they had great reviews and then i just booked a consultation so the consultation it's kind of like a vibe check. You're just kind of filling them out to feel like is this going to be a good place for me? My consultation was virtual, so I was able to just, you know, fill them out, see if this was um like if I meshed with the doctor, if I felt comfortable with her, um got to ask my questions and then based off the reviews and how I felt after my consultation, I felt comfortable going there. But I'd say if you don't know somebody personally who has had surgery, then go ahead and just do a Google search and do your research that way. However, if you were in the New Jersey area, I highly recommend the New Jersey Bariatric Center. I went to Dr. Thomas at the New Jersey Bariatric Center if you want to use a referral from me. I don't get anything for referring people there, just so you know where I went and where I would recommend if you live in the area. All right, next question says, I have hit a plateau in weight loss. I'm only two months in and I feel like I'm slowing down. So first of all, I want to say that you did not hit a plateau. A plateau implies that you're here and you're going to stay here. You are not there. At two months post-op, your body is not done losing weight. You are simply stalled and you will lose weight again. And if you're watching, if you ask this and you're watching this video, being that it took me like a month or two to even get to this Q&A, I bet you that you have started losing weight again by the time I'm actually answering this question. But throughout your journey, and this is not going to be the last time you're going to stall. You're going to keep stalling. I've mentioned before, literally, our bodies know what is best for us. It's going to slow us down when it needs to slow us down. Keep in mind that as long as you are eating small portions, drinking your water, taking your vitamins, and pooping, and moving your body, if you're doing all of those things, it is just a stall. If any of those areas you can improve in, improve in those areas and see what happens. But if you improve in that area and it's still not, nothing's happening, it is just a stall. Have somebody hide that scale from you for a little bit and then you'll see the scale start moving again. In the meantime, try on clothes that was too tight before and start tracking your inches because those are better ways to measure weight loss than the scale is. I'm telling y'all, the scale is evil. Divorce her, separation, file the paperwork, she's done. The scale is cool and all to be able to track your weight, but we cannot rely solely on the scale to tell us what our progress is. All right, next question says, how did you keep your spirits up when you hit a stall? Any suggestions on how to break it? So in the beginning, when I hit that first stall, I did not keep my spirits up. I beat myself up and cried. I cried like a baby. I thought that I failed. I thought I did something wrong. I thought I broke, I broke it already. Like I did, I spiraled just like everybody else did. But what I immediately did, and this is just who I am as a person, when I am going through something, my immediate reaction is to spiral. After I've spiraled and have collected myself, my next thing I do is research. So I figure out what do I need to do. So in that research is when I realized that that stall was the three-week stall, which was just due to water retention and me losing the water weight while simultaneously gaining back, um, well, me losing weight while simultaneously gaining back water weight. Once I understood that, I was able to calm down and understand that I just had to play the waiting game and kind of just wait it out. But as for every other stall, understanding that if you never stalled, you would be dust. Your you would you would look like this tree. This is what your body would look like if you never stalled, because eventually you would be zero pounds. Your body can't do that. Your body has to strategically slow you down every now and then to get you to be a healthy weight. And remember, our goal should be to reach a healthy body weight. And what a healthy body weight is for you is going to be different than what a healthy weight for me is. A healthy body weight for me is going to be different than what a healthy body weight for that person is. We're all so different that I think the biggest thing that causes us to have these negative thoughts is seeing other people's journeys and comparing ourselves to people that are not us. 
I think that being a part of an online community like my channel is, is great for inspo, it's great for connection, being able to see someone going through something similar for you. What it is not great for is comparing yourself to other people because we are all so dramatically different. Our bodies are different, our genetics are different, our lifestyles are different. So I think that's what really causes the negative um, mental thoughts because you're like, okay, this person lost this much weight at this point and I'm not, I'm stalled, I'm never gonna get there. We want to talk nicely to ourselves and speak positivity into our journey and trust in the process to know that stalls are genuinely a part of the process. They're going to happen. This stall that you're in, let me look at the question again, two months out, you're going to have like 15 more stalls. It's going to keep happening. So if you can get yourself into the right mindset now of understanding that it will happen, keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Don't let the stall mean, okay, I'm stalled. Now I'm about to eat a box of donuts because I'm stalled and I'm hopeless. No, keep doing what you're supposed to do. Keep eating small portions. Keep moving your body. Keep drinking your water. Keep taking your vitamins. Keep pooping regularly because nine times out of 10, you're not stalled. You just need to poop. Keep doing all of those things you're supposed to do and the scale will move eventually when your body is ready. That's how you stay in a healthy spirit. Really just understanding the, how this works and that this is really just the process. All right, next question says, what is your face care routine? So I know this is not anything to do with VSG, but I, I answered, um, the, I believe all of the questions other than the duplicates that I, um, that I saw. So my face care routine, I'll answer that. Um, I just have a non-negotiable where I do not go to sleep. I won't even take a nap if I have makeup on my face. I make sure, or even if I don't, like I will wash my face before I go to sleep every single day and it's important to me. Usually if I'm at work all day and I come home, I'll wash my face when I get home. I don't like to let makeup sit on my face for very long. If I go to the gym, I don't like to let sweat sit on my face for very long. I'm just very careful with my face. Also, I use um, hyaluronic acid and a moisturizer every single day. I do not go outside without sunscreen. I don't care if it's summer, winter, spring, fall, whatever the season is. I wear sunscreen every single day that I exit my house. I think all of those things have led to my skin being very, very clear. Um, I do have on makeup right now, but even without makeup, my, I have clear skin. I did not have clear skin prior to doing these things. I named everything I'm naming, especially the sunscreen, I think, and washing my face and not sleeping in makeup is what has caused my skin to improve in the way that it does. I also think that my diet and the amount of water I drink also play a role in that as well. Next question says, did you need to do an 11 day liquid diet before surgery? And did you get your grub on before? <laughs> All right, so to the liquid diet, no, I did not have a liquid diet before surgery. I had a um, two week, 1200 calorie diet that I had to do, that was my liver shrinking diet. We did not do a liquid diet. I'm happy about that because I don't know, I think that would have stressed me out, but every doctor is different. The whole reason for the liver shrinking diet, whether it's a liquid diet or a 1200 calorie diet, is to make your liver smaller as you prepare for surgery to make surgery go easier for the doctor. It's not even about weight loss. I think a lot of people think that the purpose of that diet is to lose some weight first. It's not. It's really just to shrink your liver so there's better visibility when your doctor's doing your surgery. So I think if you do have to do a liquid diet, think of it that way. You're not doing this for weight loss. You're doing this so that there are less complications during your surgery because this is major surgery. So you want your doctor to have an easier time. If your doctor thinks you need to do a liquid diet to do that, by all means, make sure you do that because the we need you safe. We want you here. So anything you can do to make surgery go easier for your doctor, you want to make sure you do it. But for me personally, no, I had a two week, 1200 calorie diet. As far as getting my grub on, I did. Right before my two week, 1200 calorie diet started, I was on vacation. During that time I was traveling a lot, I went on vacation. We went to an all inclusive hotel and I ate everything. I was, woo, I was eating everything. I called it my food funeral. I ate everything they had i ate to the max did i need to do that no because everything i ate i can still eat now but that's what i felt i needed to do so i surely did get my grub on and have a food funeral prior to my 1200 calorie diet and it did not impact me negatively so if you want to have a food funeral go on <laughs> next question is did you count your calories when you were losing your first year no, I did not count calories, and the reason I did not count calories is because I knew for a fact that what I was eating was nowhere close to the amount of calories that a woman needs in order to lose weight. Like, I think it's like, what is it, like 1,500 calories? It's like 
you're not supposed to eat more than that or else you would gain weight or to maintain weight whatever it is I knew that I wasn't even getting 1200 if I was getting a thousand calories that was a stretch right so I just knew that I wasn't getting enough calories what I was focusing on was measuring my food so I knew that I wasn't eating more than about three ounces of food at the time um, towards closer to a year that switched up to four ounces um, and I did that for um, about four months I want to say I don't remember I mentioned it in earlier in the Q&A but um, I didn't wait the whole first year I didn't um, weigh my food it was just for, like the first like four ish months I would weigh my food um, just so I can get a good idea of how much I should be eating and then I just focused on not overeating so I didn't count my calories because to me that feels like diet culture and diet culture to me is toxic I thought what was more important was for me to have a healthy relationship with food and weighing my food in the beginning so I can understand visually what does three ounces of food look like? What does four ounces of food look like? What does five ounces of food look like? Me being able to visually understand that helped me understand how I needed to portion my food out to properly eat. Like even when I go to restaurants, I put my food on a separate plate so I know how much I should be eating versus me counting how much calories is in it. Because I think that's a lot less important than me not overstuffing myself. So to answer that question simply, no, I don't count calories. I just eat small portions. Next question says, four months post-op and only 30 pounds down, is that bad? And in every grouping of questions, I'm seeing that similar question. No, four months post-op, 30 pounds, that's not bad. You are doing great. Do not be so hard on yourself. Also keeping in mind that everybody is different. So if you're looking at my journey or someone else's journey and thinking, oh, they lost more, so I must be failing. No, your body is losing weight at the pace that is right for you. At four months post-op, I can tell you're not eating enough to gain weight. So your body is simply just losing weight at the pace that is right for you. You do not want your body to be losing weight at a pace that is unhealthy for you. So just trust your body that it's doing the right thing for you. Also keeping in mind that what your starting weight is, is going to impact how quickly you lose weight. Typically people who start at a heavier starting weight lose weight in the beginning faster than people who start off at a lower starting weight. So that could also play a role in it. I don't know what your starting weight was. But the, and then genetics play a role, your lifestyle plays a role. There's so many things that play a role in this. Instead of focusing on if that's bad or if that's good, focus on are you doing the things that you know you're supposed to do? Are you keeping your, your meals small and not overeating, not indulging, especially at four months, you should still be building your relationship with food and not indulging in too many junk foods or things like that. If you know you're doing the right things, then just trust your body and know that your body is doing what is best for you. All right, next question says, how long was your stall? See, a lot of the questions are about stalls. I know that is what trips us up the most. Trust me, I get it. How long was your stall? Anything over two months? I, I don't think I had anything over two months. I think my longest stall was probably about a month. I'm actually going to verify that for you by just looking at my chart like I have a chart as I mentioned in I think the first video if you go down to the description box of any of my VSG videos I always have my weight at each month so I can see that at I can see my two week stall so I week two I was 245 week three still 245 so I see that weight didn't really move there then at one month I was 237 so I lost a little bit of weight there but I don't I have at five months 197 at six months 190 so only seven pounds lost there so things like that I might have considered a little bit of a stall so I want to say my longest stall maybe around a month three weeks to a month is what it lasted but stalls can last anywhere from a few days to two to three months it all depends on your body and not every stall means you're not losing weight so make sure you're trying on clothes, make sure you're taking your measurements, and make sure, I'm gonna have, I'm repeating this so many times because it's so important. Make sure that you are eating small portions, that you are drinking your water, you're taking your vitamins, you're moving your body, and you are pooping regularly. If you're doing all of those things and you are still stalled, literally just wait. Waiting is gonna be the best thing you can do. Throw the scale out the window or have somebody hide it from you. For if you've already been stalled for two months, give it another month. Have somebody hide the scale from you for a month or a week or however long you think you can go without weighing yourself. Just to give yourself some time to just focus on what you're supposed to be focusing on and not being so caught up on the scale. 
go in your closet find those pair of jeans that did not fit you try them on see how they fit better now and that's how you know you're actually losing inches and losing fat versus the scale because there are so many things that can impact the scale that have nothing to do with gaining fat but with that, that was the last question of my three-part VSG Q&A series. I genuinely hope that you guys got some valuable information from this and that you thought this was a valuable series. As I continue along my journey, I'm going to do more of these because as I continue along my journey, my perspective changes depending on where I'm at in my journey. Now that I'm done, I've done all three videos. If you have any questions that were still not answered, make sure to put them in the comments and I will get to them. If you are someone who has had surgery and you see a comment down there that you can answer, don't wait for me to answer it. Go ahead and answer it. We are all part of this community and I want us to help each other out. And also keeping in mind that my perspective is not everybody's perspective. So if you have something different to offer, go ahead and give that person some advice. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in my next video. Where in the world is Karen San Diego? From BK to Belly, it's anywhere she say so. She changing your life, can see it straight through her eyes.